Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our panelists and attendees joining us today from across the globe. My name is Rohan and I, along with my colleagues Sandeep and Isha, would be the moderators for today's exciting event. I would like to thank you for taking time out from your busy schedule to attend this Power Hour session hosted by Harbinger. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Power Hour is a series of interactive roundtable discussions amongst industry stalwarts where they share their experiences and insight on a particular topic. So the topic for today's Power Hour is Amp Up Learner Engagement in Virtual Classroom. Just a few housekeeping tips to ensure you can hear us properly. In case you cannot, please feel free to dial in using a phone. And it's now time to introduce our host, Dr. Vikas Joshi. Dr. Vikas Joshi is a business leader who is passionate about product development and technology entrepreneurship. His mission is to help create software products that make a difference. And a key part of this mission is to inspire tech professionals and entrepreneurs to grow and develop. Welcome Vikas and over to you. Thank you very much, Rohan. And welcome everybody once again. Our discussion today has three parts. One, the challenges and opportunities in virtual classrooms. As you know, most of us are now teaching virtually. Four cool tips on how to make your virtual classrooms engaging and fun. And some tools for learner engagement. And to talk about all of this, we have a great panel today. Before I welcome them, I want to share some recent research in just a quick minute, only to highlight the issue of learner engagement in virtual classrooms. So here it is. As you can see, over 70% trainers say that learner engagement is their top challenge, their number one challenge in remote learning, how to engage learners. Over 56% say that they do not feel prepared to facilitate remote learning. And over 42% say that they alone are responsible for deciding what remote or online tools they will use. So when you take these three findings together, the importance of today's discussion becomes evident. Instructors must amp up learner engagement they must prepare themselves to do so, and they themselves must select the tools for engagement. Now, this is the perfect time to welcome our panel. We have with us Carol Oliver, director at TopKit. She's a sportswoman, a fencer actually, a business person and educator, and known as the pioneer of mobile learning in Australia. Terry Trout is founder and CEO at Ontology, a professional training and coaching organization specializing in leadership development. Dr. Nina Shevde is a physicist, teacher, and entrepreneur who is director at LERNAC, a career prep academy. And Srujan Chaudhary, while well, we needed a student on the panel because this is about student engagement. Srujan joins us from Western Washington University in Pacific Northwest. Welcome to all of you and let's ask our panelists what makes them interested in this topic. And perhaps we could start with you, Carol, over to you. Thanks, Vikas. Um, my interest and in, uh, my love of, of online and mobile learning started from the day that we first had handheld devices to use. Um, my experience then, I was, I was working at a tourism and hospitality college and we got a whole handful of old PDAs, um, which at that time were revolutionary. And I gave them to the absolutely the worst group of students in the college. They were the, the ones that were deemed to be non-good learners. They were the ones that were deemed to be dropping out. And we started working with them using these devices that completely engaged them. And it was just stunning to see how quickly they turned around and how quickly they got involved and engaged in what they were doing. And 
at the end of the day, it was just about getting them involved. It was just about giving them things that they identified with and could use. Um, it was very early days of smartphones, iPads, all of those sort of things. So these, these things were quite precious. They were very expensive at the time. And I was lucky that the college agreed to pay for them. But what it did for those students and what it did for me going forward was made me realize that anybody can be engaged with learning if you do give them the right tools and the right stimulus to make them want to learn. And in this instance, it was giving them a stimulus the way they could do things in their own time, in their own way, and in very small bites. Um, and, th and that really has been the basis of where I've gone to ever since. And everything that I do now with all my clients and, and with all the people that I work with is keep breaking things down into eatable chunks for everybody. The old saying of you eat an elephant one mouthful at a time, that's exactly what we've been doing. And it, it really has proven to be valuable. And now when we're working things like Zoom and, and things like that, those principles still apply. Um, people are very easily distracted, very easily bored, and we have to keep bringing them back, keep getting their attention, and keep giving them things to stimulate the next thought. That's terrific, Carol. Thank you, and welcome again on the panel. The next, Harry. Oh, sure. Um, it, mine was for money. Um, you know, it's love of money. Um, my company has been developing face-to-face uh, -face leadership, you know, traditional leadership development programs, customizing them for con uh, companies across the world. And you know, we've been doing it since 1992. Uh, we had some blended learning. Uh, we use virtual for reinforcement, but, you know, we never really, until the pandemic came along, had a, a, a need to push ourselves into the virtual learning space because so much of leadership development, um, you could argue, you know, is, is best uh, served in a traditional classroom. Well, that changed. And so if we wanted to stay viable, stay alive, we needed to create something. And um, my background in instructional design said, you can't just take a slide deck and you, you know, throw it on Zoom or some other platform. We mm -hmm. essentially uh, dissolved our training um, and resurrected it from the very, you know, ground up. And so I know more, a couple of things we're going to be talking today about uh, engagement uh, questions, that sort of thing. It, it really does, in my, my opinion, require that you, if you're looking to move from traditional face-to-face -to, -face to virtual, uh, you have to rethink what you're, what you're training. Uh, you know, for Carol, this may come you know, natural and obvious based on her experience. But for us in the traditional space, it was not at all uh, natural or, or easy to do. And so I'd like to, you know, share some of the things that we've uh, encountered over the past, uh, you know, six months uh, in, in having thrown ourselves into this vigorously, but also with a, an eye f uh, looking at it from an instructional design perspective. So that's me. Terrific. Dissolve and resurrect content. I love that. Yep. All right. Dr. Ninat Shevde, would you like to go next? Yeah. Um, my, um, uh, you know, I came across the online learning, uh, you know, sometime in um, 2012 uh, uh, when, I, when I did my first course with Coursera and, and then just passed off. Um, and it was actually in 2018 when I visited my uh, brother-in-law in, in, in Melbourne, Australia. Um, that's, that's when I actually saw my niece's uh, 11th grade and 12th grade books. And uh, uh, she was pretty much uh, kind of stressed out if, if she took physics, what would happen? And that's when I said, okay, uh, how about kind of, you know, uh, starting this process of online learning? And uh, when I came back, uh, started having dis discussions with uh, multiple people and uh, um, my brother-in-law um, uh, is an ex-employee of Harbinger and he said, why don't you ask Harbinger? And uh, that is when I approached and uh, this whole process of uh, you know, creating this uh, online uh, platform for, for students in Australia actually started and it got created and uh, uh, I had already started teaching uh, my niece in, in November of 2019 and uh, the platform was virtually ready. 
and suddenly in the month of uh, March, the pandemic struck and uh, we sure. went into this uh, lockdown era and uh, we ran up the things and, uh, uh, you know, started uh, uh, concentrating on the academy which I run and uh, we just ran it up and uh, the online learning uh, has been a very fascinating journey for past uh, uh, six months. It's going to evolve and I'm getting more and more excited uh, how we can actually engage the students more and more. Uh, it's an evolving uh, phase as far as I'm concerned. Excellent. Well, good luck for your adventure. Now we have the most special panelist here, Srujan. Uh, Srujan's a student. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, like, like you said, I'm a student at Western Washington University. Um, I had done an internship over the summer with some Raptivity Virtual Classroom products. And I just wanted to talk about sort of the ways that student or that online learning affects students and the ways that maybe it could be improved and how we feel about it kind of. Sure, so we, we have, uh, <clears throat> how should I say? I have fastened my seat belts and I'm ready to listen to you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for joining. And uh, we'll get right along with uh, our first part of today's presentation, which is challenges and opportunities in virtual classrooms. Now, virtual classroom, as you know, is very different from physical classroom, right? Students are in different places. They may or may not have their videos on, you don't know what they're doing, whether they're pay paying attention, whether they are with you. Is interaction can be awkward, right? Technology can get overwhelming, you know? You need to be comfortable with the camera, your voice must be clear, your internet bandwidth should be good, you need to share your screen, keep an eye on PowerPoint, keep an eye on chat, take questions, and keep forward momentum. In other words, in other words, there's a bunch of challenges. And the inhibitors uh, primarily are short, remote attention span on the part of students and distractions. So the top challenge is how to gain and retain attention of learners, in other words, engagement. But at the same time, it's not all bad news. There is a silver lining, right? I mean, there are some enablers of success in remote learning. What are they? Here they are. You can personalize learning, right? Before the class begins, you can send your students videos and prep materials that they could take at their own pace whenever they want, whenever they're ready to learn. And you can embed activity in learning. So as we can see later in today's session, we're gonna see a lot of that, is you can add games, breakout exercises, collaborative activities, and all other kinds of fun elements to your virtual classroom. Now that sounds like a lot, but if you, have the right tools, you can do it with minimal effort. Um, and so this is a big opportunity to add virtual class activities and games. And that's kind of the top engagement opportunity. So this kind of brings us to the second topic today, which is some cool tips to amp up engagement in classroom. And our first tip is build anticipation. Let me show you a simple example of building anticipation in just a moment. But here's the, here's the principles. If you build right anticipation, it enhances the absorptive capacity. In other words, the learner can learn better. You must make the learner wonder, you know, what's gonna come next? And you have to do this in all phases of learning, not just in class, but pre-class and post-class. So before class, give learners something to look forward to. In class, introduce some amount of suspense. And then post-class, give them a chance to maybe collect rewards through some self-learning games. In other words, there's always something to look forward to. Think of, um, you know, cold calling your students, right? Sometimes you're like, you're tired of your own sound and you're like, no, I wanna ask someone to answer a question. Now, most students hate cold calls, right? But it's necessary evil, you have to do that. I'm gonna show you 
a fun way of picking a student or a group of students and asking them to answer a question. So here we go. Here's a teacher teaching class online and the instructor launches a relay. Let's see how that works. So you go start and then what do you see? You see a relay wheel, right? And it goes around when you click the button in the middle and it goes round and round until, it's, until it stops at Wildcats. That's the group that's gonna answer the question. So here pops the question, oh, is it Panther? Okay, Panther is gonna get the question. And now the next one. So it's a little bit of a fun element to do the same thing without making the students feel that the teacher is picking on them because it's just your luck, right? So in the end, you're gonna get a little leaderboard that shows you know, who did well and who did not. So that's just an example. How long does it take to put an activity like this in your PowerPoint slide deck? You'll be surprised. It takes less than a minute, that's right. And we're gonna talk more about it later. But let's go to our panelists now and ask them, what are your thoughts on building anticipation? Um, you, can, you can go pretty much in any sequence uh, or whoever wants to talk about this. Over to you. I'll, I'll start in silence. Um, it's just an interesting situation with anticipation. One of the, the things that I'm observing at the moment is with um, a lot of the kids coming back to school, having been away for six months, working from home, working online, they're kind of coming back to school with itchy fingers. They've been used to working online. They've been used to their own distractions. They've been used to their own pace. Coming back into the classroom, they are expecting the same stimuli, they're expecting the same way of approaching. They have, they're less patient with waiting for the teacher to explain things. They're less patient with waiting for the other kids to keep up with them or to understand what's going on. And, and so I think what we're going to find is that we have to do a little bit of the reverse of what we've done in the past. Whereas before we've, we've taken traditional teaching and traditional pedagogy and taken it out to technology, I think now we're going to start seeing bringing some of those things back and using some of the technology tricks. And, and the most common one, because you've already touched on, is this reward thing. Um, when kids are gaming, you know, and playing things, and when we're all playing games, there are, there are two levels of reward. There is the immediate satisfaction, the instant gratification, yes, I've achieved that level. But there is also the building, the long-term reward that builds in the background. Because you've built that level, you've won a star. But, and when you've won 10 stars, you get a reward. It's, it's that kind of approach. And it, it's combining the in instant gratification with the long-term rewards. And that's a part of the anticipation. That's a part of building the process of, of how we do it. And I think that we are quite likely now to be taking some of those lessons from technology and bringing them into a classroom environment. And that little roulette wheel you just demonstrated, very, very easy for a teacher then to turn into a, a classroom device. And so suddenly we are seeing a, a, a real integration from one end to the other, while still maintaining the same level of pedagogy in what we're doing. Um, and I just think that there's a there's going to be an interesting development an interesting change and we will be learning lessons from technology that we hadn't learned before because we were busy trying to apply traditional teaching to technology. Yeah, I would I would agree with 100% with what Carol is talking about. And this again is based off of, you know, a whole six months worth of painful experience. Um, what we landed on almost immediately was that the technology is going to drive the engagement. The features, the functionality of the technology is going to either help you or hurt you in terms of what you can do um, on the platform. And so, you know, my number one uh, learning, I guess, along the way was get to know the features of the platform. And we actually selected a platform based on features. It, it was 
we started there and then moved from there into then designing and developing our courses. So um, in, a, in a, our environment where we're training leaders, uh, and these are leaders who in often cases don't want to come to the training, they didn't sign up for it, it's just a mandatory training, being able to paint the, the picture of what they're going to get out of it. So we really have to spend a lot of time marketing our, uh, the value of our courses, what, what you expect to you know, achieve as a result of it. All the other things that Carol talked about, gamification, et cetera, fit in. Uh, but for us, it's really you know, what's in it for me, um, being able to paint that. So those are my two, two thoughts regarding anticipation. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because as a as a internal learning leader or as a vendor of learning services, yeah. um, marketing the benefits of learning was always important, but never so important as it never is. Never so important. You're right. There's yep. too much of free content out there, and you yep. wanna be able to make a good case for for something that's curated and specifically designed and tailored. And you have to live and you have to live up to the hype. You know, if you hype a program and it doesn't, you know, live up to the expectations that you've set, um, you get a bad reputation pretty quickly. So um, this is it's it's critical to do the marketing, but also then to you know walk the walk. So sure. sure. Uh, did you want to add anything, Neenat? Yeah, I, I would like to add uh, here. It it actually depends on um, what level of uh, learning uh, process one is involved in, or what what sort of online learning you're involved in. Whether it's a school level, or it's a high school level, or college level or you know, um, management level, uh, because the approaches are definitely going to be uh, different depending on the culture background of that particular country. Um, and at the same time, it's also going to depend upon the number of students that you are teaching. Uh, because if the number of students is less, uh, then in that case, uh, you know, one can uh, get involved in kind of uh, uh, accepting the gaming strategies like Rule, which you which you which you showcase. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the the level at which I'm involved, which is grade eleven and twelve, it's a very focused, goal oriented training that I'm involved in, and and I'm I'm catering to a mass of students. Uh, so there, I'm on the learning curve of how to build the anticipation. And two of the uh, two of the uh, important and interesting products, which 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 I feel have turned out to be interesting, because I've already said that I'm on the learning curve as far as online uh, training is concerned. Uh, one is uh, Raptivity, uh, which I found uh, pretty interesting, and uh, the other one which I found interesting was Kahoot, uh, where where we could you know kind of uh, uh, post lecture could send uh, some questions to the students and students were pretty excited because, because you know, science coming in the form of a fun game is kind of alien to Indians. Uh, so that was kind of a, a welcome thing which, which, which happened. Uh, so yes, so gaming could be one thing, uh, but we need to give a thought to kind of, you know, this uh, uh, pre-class, in-class and post-class ideas that you have uh, proposed. And I think these three tips will go a long way kind of in, in, in the evolving process that we are in right now. Great, uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts, uh, Ninad. Uh, I just wanna make sure, uh, a real quick uh, sound check here. Uh, Rohan, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can, uh, because we can hear you. Uh, there's just a little lag on the video. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen right here. Uh, just let me know if you can see my see my screen. Yes. Yep. Okay. Pardon me for a second, real quick. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Good. Uh, so let's uh, let's uh, move on and uh, ask Srijan. Do you think on online teachers do a good job of building anticipation? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think that I'm in a situation in my school where I'm past high school, I'm past K through 12 learning. And so it's 
moving on to things that I'm interested in rather than things that I have to learn. So mm -hmm. it's almost a little bit of a difficult question because while I look forward to learning, so I might say that teachers build anticipation well because I'm looking forward to my class or the content that I'm going to be tested on. Most students that I talk to probably do not feel that their teachers do a good job of building anticipation because in most cases, people are not looking to learn the most from their degree. They're, they're paying for their degree and they're looking to graduate and have that as a signaling device to employers that they went through college and they're trying to do the minimum work possible to get through this process. So not only are they not looking forward to learning, but it would be very difficult for their teachers to get them to look forward to learning. And so it's sort of an uphill battle for a college professor to get a student taking a required class to build anticipation for that student. But I think that one of the, uh, one of the things that would help the process along a little bit maybe is, um, I think gamification is definitely a big part of it. And um, the other part of it is it efficiency, sort of, because we have, I take 18 credits, which means I have at least five hours of homework a day. So while mm -hmm. I do want my content to be gamified so I can retain it better, and I think that PowerPoint and uninteresting presentations are forgotten a lot more easily, it is like a trade-off between I'm not going to spend more time to better learn a little bit of content than I am I choose the more boring option rather than the more interesting option if it means it's going to save me a little bit of time. Sure. So there has to be a building of anticipation, I think, along with keeping everything efficient. Especially can I, in the Can I ask you a question on that? I, I'm really interested in what you're saying. What might pop into your inbox that would be encouraging you to go and explore further and what might pop into your inbox that would make you think, oh God, I'll do that later? Oh, well, a perfect answer to both would be um, infographics because teachers, especially last quarter, have started using infographics either extremely well or extremely poorly. A good infographic excites me a lot because it means I can get everything I need very quickly and it's fun for me to go through. It has, it's just a little bit more interesting than PowerPoint. On the other hand, teachers that have poorly set up infographics that have a lot of unnecessary information or they don't work very well, that's a big time waster and was definitely a big time waster for me last quarter because generally they don't post any alternative to that presentation. Mm. So that's definitely one area where I look forward to interesting presentations that are set up correctly and that are set up more for a higher education, but definitely a big time waster. And the thing that sort of kills your motivation is the, um, the drawn out infographics, the sort of yep. the over gamified content. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, just a quick follow up on that, but is, is, is that representative of other students in your class or does it have something to do with you being an artist and a visual very visual person in most cases i would say that most students actually that i've talked to don't enjoy the more interactive presentations just because they're trying to move along quickly i enjoy it a little bit more than my peers but i would say that definitely when it's set up correctly the students prefer an engaging presentation. It's just that it's so new that it's still difficult to set up. Sure, and my question was specific about the infographics. Um, is, that, is that something your peer students as well find engaging when done rightly? Yes, yes, every time. Great. Great. Yes, Kahoot has its limits. Thank you. All right. So with that, I think we're gonna we're going to move on to the uh, next tip, which is introducing elements of competition and collaboration. You need to strike a balance of competition and collaboration, right? Games and gamification are super helpful in that respect. You can have a Jeopardy game in a classroom, which is where people compete. 
and you can have a brainstorming activity in which everyone collaborates. I'm going to show you an example of a game element. Um, so here's some kind of a common challenge for everybody and everyone's sort of answering. And then the teacher wants to collect all answers. And this is a place where they are collaborating to get most answers right. Okay. So now it's time for our third cool tip, which is well, but before we go there, we're going to do a poll. Um, Rohan, can you bring up the poll, please? And this is about yes. taking questions. In a classroom, people raise their hand and the teacher says, okay, go ahead, but ask your question. But in remote setting, um, there's a couple of different ways you can do this, right? Take questions as they come or save them for the end. And sometimes it depends. So what's your preference in taking questions? We already have uh, votes coming in. Thank you for that. Nearly 50% already, wow. See, we're all engaged. We are totally engaged. <laughs> and obviously there's, there's no one right way, uh, but at a fundamental level, you need the student to ask questions as they occur, not wait. But then you also need a way to minimize interruption, right? And um, Rohan, go ahead and uh, show the results if you can, please. Yes, I'm just about to share the results and you'll see it on your screen any minute. There you okay. go. So about 51% prefer to take questions as they come, and then the rest are divided between the other two options. Okay, thank you. So how do you strike this balance of you know, minimizing interruption and encouraging people to ask questions? You use a parking lot, and here's, um, Here's what the parking lot activity does. It organizes learner input. Too many questions can be chaotic. And you can have questions in chat, questions in questions panel, but then there's pros and cons to that. Let me show you a cool way of doing this, okay? Just see what happens here. There's a teacher that says, okay, you have a parking lot. You can go ahead and park your questions there. I'm not gonna show you how they do that. It's super simple. But here's how the parking lot looks, okay? The teacher actually sees a bunch of cars that are parked in a lot, and the teacher, in this case, selects a car, and that's the question, marks the question as answered once he or she answers it, and moves on, and that's how it goes. It's as simple as that, right? And in the end, you would know how many questions were answered and what remained, right? And you might wonder how long it takes to build an activity like this. And now by now, you, you'll say I sound like a broken record because it takes less than a minute. And we're gonna show you how to do that in a few minutes. But let's move on to our fourth and final tip today before we invite our panelists, okay? And the fourth and final tip is to pay attention to body language. Use gestures, but keep them in line of sight. You know, the camera should be able to see your gestures. Take pauses, literally and figuratively. Practice your posture and think about the impression you wanna make. And prioritize empathy and understanding. It takes active listening to see what's going on and to listen to your learners. So this is a good time to go back to Carol, Terry, and Ninad and ask them, what are your thoughts on cold calls, taking questions, body language, or any other tips you might have for our attendees today? Um, I think I would like to go on that first. Um, very recently, I just started this, uh, uh, this process of cold calls. Um, and um, 
as i said it it, it all depends on uh, the type of uh, you know audience you're addressing uh, and because ours is a very focused kind of you know a goal of completing the syllabus and preparing them for competitive exam uh, what actually happens in the process is that uh, there are very few uh, students uh, who are actually asking the questions and you realize that in the same set of students are asking the questions again and again uh, in order to kind of uh, uh, surprise some of the students i started asking uh, questions and uh, you know, uh, the responses used to be, well, uh, my mic is not working. Uh, I don't have a mic. Uh, I'm not in a position to answer that question. Uh, so these are some of the reasons. Uh, so, you know, um, in, in the type of uh, learning that I'm involved in, uh, it's more often becomes a one-way process uh, with, with a very less percentage of students actually um, asking the questions. Uh, so that's that's been my... Um, bitter experience, if you may, uh, to kind of, you know, uh, engage the students as far as, you know, asking the questions concerned. Uh, that has been my experience. Yeah. And I, I don't really mind. You, Nenad. And uh, Terry, please go ahead. Yeah. So I was going to build off of uh, that comment or those comments. And um, I think one of the things that we've learned is uh, in the design of the training, we use questions as a way of inviting input. And so, um, you know, a logical piece of that is, you know, simply asking, are there any questions? But typically our building anticipation is, you know, what, what is, you know, the, what are the two characteristics of your favorite leader? You know, for example, and that leads into a discussion of the different characteristics because you know in the design of your training that you're going to anticipate that there are going to be certain characteristics that come up all the time. And so we actually use questions as a way of uh, inviting input. Uh, and typically when you invite input, and this is why I selected it depends uh, on that poll, poll question, is that um, you, know, you start creating an environment where uh, questions are expected, questions are allowed, uh, you know, chat, you can put them in chat, you can put them, you know, come off mute and ask the question. Uh, but typically our experience is so, I don't wanna say scripted, but uh, led by questions that people have a chance for uh, providing input. And that was a tremendous flip. You know, if you're used to designing training, you have your objectives, uh, you know, you design your information, your presentation, uh, and then you build in a question at the end of the module saying, hey, does anybody have any questions? It's completely flipped from that. And, uh, you know, if there's any reading that needs to happen, it happens before the training. I mean, it just completely uh, turns, uh, turns everything on its head. And that was a, a very powerful learning for us. And you have to have not only um, a facilitator who's comfortable in doing that, uh, but you also have to, in my estimation, have to have a Rohan by your side, you know, producing this in such a way so, and, and Sandeep, you know, so that you have people who are supporting you and able to handle all the questions, all the technical issues so that you can facilitate true interaction. Um, so there you go. Uh, I, there's nothing more I can add to that. What I wanted to do though, was just to talk about a little bit about the body language and a, a touch a little bit on an area that, that's slightly off beam for this, but when you think that 60, 65% of learners are visual learners, and in this environment, we've got more and more kinetic learners who want to do things and, and show things. A lot of my experience has been with adult learners with, with vocational topics, people who want to do things, they want to learn how to do something. And, and we're in an environment now where, you know, if you want to learn how to change a plug, you go onto YouTube, watch someone do it, and then do it yourself. What you don't want to do is learn how electricity works. You just want to do that particular job. And I right. think one of the things that, that's coming across with a lot of the stuff with Zoom at the moment is body language now has become important where it wasn't before. I always used to tell people when we were doing, they were doing online learning courses that they needed to have something on a regular basis, every three or four minutes where they would engage someone to do something to keep them there because you couldn't see if they were bored, if they were slumped, if something was distracting them. With Zoom, you have a better chance of doing that. You can start picking up some of the body language, but you still have this issue of, of the engagement and of, of the doing things. 
And I wonder whether not with some of these courses and particularly with what Terry is talking about, that you perhaps need to send people away to do something and then come back and report on it rather than have them sitting in front of you for an hour asking questions and answering questions. I would be having them online for 15 minutes, sending them away to practice on something and then come back at the next day or the day after a report on how they progressed with those things. Because I think that that is a much better way of getting them to respond because they'll have something to tell you that's quite specific. People are quite shy about asking questions because they don't want to feel stupid, which is normal. Um, and they don't realize that everybody else has got the same question in their head. But if you send them away to do something and they talk about the experience of having done it, you've achieved three things. First of all, you've, you have educated them. Secondly, they've practiced and worked out whether they've understood. And thirdly, they have something to say about it. That is so true. In fact, uh, what you just said, uh, Carol, um, it, it, I also see this uh, something similar on uh, on the chat here. I think uh, Maria Regina has uh, has um, something very interesting. Uh, she says, uh, for an online session, an advanced communication encouraging learners to post their questions could be a good way of organizing and answering questions. I use Google Form for this, and I incorporate the questions in my discussion points. So that's, uh, thank you for that, uh, Maria. Mm. Terrific. All right. Um, so let's move right along here to our last uh, topic of the day, which is tools for learner engagement. Here are some tools you might want to look at. There's an activity that has 10 activities, different activities that you could embed in your slide decks and run in your class. You've already seen the relay and the parking lot. Those are reactivity activities. Reactivity also has other games, assessments, and cool displays that students love. There's a free trial. You can use it absolutely free for any number of students. And there is also a monthly subscription that you can, that you can purchase. And then there are other tools. There's Socrative, there's H5P, Slido, Kahoot, and so on. Some of them are free, some of them are paid. I do have a question for you, speaking of free and paid. Uh, in fact, I have a quick little poll here. Uh, can we bring that up, Rohan? Yes, because. There you go. What's your budget per month for using tools that let you build activities, games, engagement, breakouts, polls, you know, collaborative, uh, you know, exercises and so on? I actually have something to add after this. I was looking to oh, say it before. Yeah. Please go ahead. Go right ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, I just had something to say about the answering questions and the cold calls because I mm -hmm. had written down a couple of things about that. Um, sure. It was that one of the main, I like the idea for the parking lot a lot because I, I voted that questions should be answered after class just because I've noticed that questions are a big distraction during class, which they aren't, I feel, in in-person classrooms because a teacher can sort of answer a question really quickly with the board behind her, the board behind him and the, and the student is there. So there's a little bit more face-to-face -face explaining that can happen. It's a little bit easier, but in the Zoom setting, I've had classes where sometimes most of the class has gone to just a few questions. Um, like someone had mentioned earlier, generally only a few students ask questions in class. So it's really easy for the class to get derailed mm -hmm. and um, so I like the idea of having all the questions at the end of class in a parking lot setting where you can answer them one by one I would say the only thing is that it would be nice if it was possible for the teacher to look at the sort of size of the question or the depth of the question before they answer it so they can answer all the surface level questions quickly during class that everyone has and then maybe mm -hmm. they could 
tell the students with the bigger questions to come in during office hours if there's a lot of them one time or something like that. And then that would maybe save a lot of time during the classroom mm -hmm. setting. The, the big questions do not just get dispersed in with the small questions. Sure. And then in regard to cold calls, at my school actually there's a, I've never pursued this, but there is some, there's a way where you can have it so that teachers are not allowed to call on you because you're embarrassed to speak in front of students. And um, many students op opt in for that. So not a lot of cold calling actually happens in my classes because maybe 10, 15 students don't opt in for not being cold called and those 15 students answer questions anyways. So it, in the end, the cold calling it, I agree with it. I'd like to be cold called. Well, I don't like to be cold called, but I'm okay with it. But it's easy to opt out of that, at least at my school. And so another option might be to have sort of a queue for students who want to answer questions so that it's not like those 15 students are constantly fighting to answer each question. The teacher can just have the question ready maybe beforehand and students can get in the queue, answer questions one after one another because that's another thing that takes up a little bit of time is the teacher asks a question and a couple of students fight to answer it. Everyone gets off track a little bit. And the last part is mm -hmm. that an issue I have with cold calls is that I like to learn. I like to be engaged in class, but mm -hmm. I have a very complicated name and I get cold called very little, um, regardless of how, how many like times I answer questions or how engaged I am in class, just because a teacher who has never met me in person does not know how to say my name. So they just don't call on me in that classroom setting. So I thought that maybe there's a better way to answer and ask questions that have not been brought up yet. Interesting. Can I, a, go ahead. Yeah, Vikas, I'd like to build off of that because one of the things that we've uh, tried to do is we use chat as a way mm -hmm. of seating, seating, you know, so we'll ask the question, please respond in chat. And then what we'll do is we will cold call off of the chat list. That way we know who is actually participating, who's paying attention in terms of do they have an answer. And sometimes the chat answers are interesting or they help us as facilitators guide the discussion in a certain way. So right. it's a little bit of both using chat to make sure everybody's involved, but then also using the cold call as a way of expanding or directing the learning. I, I would like to add, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, one point regarding the questions being asked in chat box. Uh, usually what happens is that uh, uh, when, uh, when you kind of uh, ask the students, does anyone have a question? And if you are catering to a mass class, then, uh, you know, a couple of students ask the question and rest of them say yes, no, yes, no. And this, this the actual question actually gets lost in that chaos of yes and no. So uh, it is it is there that you know uh, the, the the tool like uh, parking lot will be uh, very helpful. Now that has to be a blend of uh, using a parking lot as well as the as the chat box because uh, I feel that uh, uh, there are certain questions in the in the in the process of lecture which should be answered right away so that you know the continuity of the lecture is is there. Uh, because some might, some, someone might ask a very critical question and you need to answer that question before proceeding to the next idea that you're going to teach. So I, I think it's, it's, it's got to be a bit of both. Uh, 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 taking major questions towards the end of the lecture, but answering some interesting questions right away. It might consume uh, you know, uh, lecture time, but I, I think sure. it is helpful for the continuity process. Thank you. Thanks for all those views. Um, I'll just add something that I observed one of my professors of uh, negotiation and conflict resolution uh, at Harvard uh, used to do uh, on the occasions when he delivered a lecture. He would, uh, he, would, he would typically take four or five questions at a time and then weave a theme through them. In other words, instead of taking a question and answering it, he would say, okay, let me get some more questions. And then he would to successfully, uh, you know, like a theme uh, that would pretty much cover um, several questions. And that doesn't always work, but uh, he, he was good at it. Um, in the meantime, we have poll results here. And uh, 
52% people say, I prefer free tools. I would expect 100% to say, I prefer free tool. Everybody prefers free. Um, but of course, we have the rest split between the three different price points. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's stop sharing the poll, please, and uh, move along right here to, um, to the question on, are we still sharing the results? Maybe not. Okay. What are your favorite engagement tools? Uh, if you want to name a tool or two that you have used a lot, uh, that'd be great. I, I, I might just start off on this and everyone can go from there. Um, because we do so much of our stuff for people to use independently. Um, the, the material and the things that I work on are not for college lecturers. They're not necessarily for live online use. They are for use um, in distance, they use on mobile devices. So we always work on the basis of breaking everything down as, as small as we possibly can so that someone can actually do a module sitting on the bus, on the train or whatever. So every time we start looking at putting together a, a, a course or a, a bit of activity, I operate on three very simple levels. The first one is the information that we have to share. And we look at activities that give us the most information or give us the most room. We're big fans of reactivity. So a lot of our work we do with our activity. So we will be looking for the reactivity interactivities that give us the most words that we can put into any one thing. Um, so we look at all of those things. The second level that we do, and, and this is absolute classic um, teaching approach that we give the information. The second thing we do is we look at the activities where they can test whether they've actually understood what it is they're learning. So we look at activities, we look at things where they can um, make decisions, for example, a number of statements that they have to put into different boxes. They can't get it wrong, but they can do those activities and they can do them over and over again until they get it right, until it's in their heads. Um, we then go on to the point that we get to where they can test and, and they can either revisit the knowledge and learn again, retest their knowledge before they do it. And then when we finally get to the testing, we will do testing that enables them to get a score, to see how they're going, um, work out what else they need to learn next. But everything is kept very small. Um, everything we do is kept in very small bites. So we're not dealing with huge concepts. We're not dealing with huge things that they have to go, books that they need to read. All of those things are part of what they can do outside of the work that they're doing through what we've de delivered. We give them activities to do. We might suggest a particular thing, go away and do this, that, and the other. That's how we tend to construct it so that it is in in small bites. And that's why, as I say, using these interactivities, which seem sometimes little and silly, but we can, they have the flexibility that we can make them personalized to each course that we do. They all look different. But at the end of the day, what you're doing is just stimulating people to go and take a step forward, take a step forward. And they are very small steps. But at the end of the day, they've actually gathered quite a lot of knowledge. And, and we've done that all along, purely and simply because that's our approach to it. So this is not something for necessarily university lecturers when they're trying to give a, a whole lecture, but they are something when you want people to learn specific things and retain them. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, being a, a novice in this game, um, I have ended up using three primary tools to kind of uh, engage the students. Uh, one, of course, is uh, uh, to explain uh, the concept visually. Uh, many times I use uh, short YouTube videos. And apart from that, I, I use uh, Raptivity. Um, and I've started using Kahoot now uh, in my post-lecture scenarios. Um, 
uh, I'm going to increase the frequency where I kind of frame certain questions to test whether they've understood the ideas or not. Uh, so those are the things which I, I use. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. I, I can go next, uh, but I am very interested and I, I assume that you're going to be asking Shurjun what, what engages him because um, I'm sure. very interested in hearing that. I'm essentially going to repeat what Carol said. Uh, we're like sister and brother from a different mother here. Uh, questions, number one, you know, <laughs> using questions as a way of, and, you know, oftentimes when we think of engagement, we think of, uh, you know, gamification. And maybe I'm a old school, but getting people to ponder a question, either, you know, it's a, a question with a, you know, in a true answer to it or, or a rhetorical question, you know, like asking you to think about your favorite leader and identify the two characteristics that drove you, uh, that, that help, help you build trust, right? So, you know, being able to think like that uh, in a practical sense helps engage. Uh, and, and so uh, same thing with tests, you know, being able to, uh, write effective tests uh, and, and have people take tests as an engagement activity, right? So the final thing, I think Carol mentioned it, but it's we have a very specific name for it. It's called an, a management action plan. It's a map, right? So you learn something, how are you going to use this? So when we do leadership training, uh, most of our concepts are fairly, you know, obvious. Uh, it, it's the application of those that really is, makes the difference. And so when we ask people to uh, now apply what you're going to be, you know, what you learned to your team, right? So if we just talked about, um, you know, providing effective feedback, you know, list the members of your team and what kind of feedback are you going to give them and how are you going to give it to them in a way that they're going to uh, best receive it? Those things uh, not only kind of lead to application, but they also engage people and help drive the relevance to the training. So those are the things. Perfect. Surgeon, um, we're going to have you have the last word on this, but uh, we are kind of three minutes from the top of the hour. So maybe you want to take a couple of minutes, leave one yeah. for me. I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, I would like it if in my classrooms we used more things like the parking lot and the roulette to address some of the problems I talked about earlier. But the main tool that we use in my classrooms is breakout rooms, which is they're flawed a little bit because oftentimes we go into breakout rooms and if it's a group of four, two of the students will just walk away from the computer and then you're sort of left a little bit stranded wow. there. But um, <laughs> that's in smaller classes, the teachers visit each group so it happens less, but definitely in the classes over 50 people, it's um, most of the students don't show up for the breakout groups. But I would I guess we lost your audio here, Srijan. Um, Isha, can you check, please? I think he's completely frozen. Yeah, it looks like he's, he's frozen. All right. So let's uh, let's bring him back in a second. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. What I'm going to do is move right along and uh, uh, just do quick takeaways from today. Engagement strategies span the whole cycle, pre-class, in-class, and post-class. Surujan, we're going to bring you back in just a minute. Sorry Build about anticipation, your introduce games, eliminate chaos, select the right tools. That's it. We could have done this whole thing in just one minute, and this is what that is, all right? So I'm going to ask my colleague Sandeep to unmute himself and just tell us a little bit about Harbinger Tools, maybe 30 seconds, a quick plug, and then we'll bring back Surujan for the last word. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Vikas. And uh, thank you all participants for interesting views. And of course, uh, uh, on chat, we got so much interesting, again, uh, information. So about Harbinger Tools, uh, of course, like we have seen uh, some of the examples of uh, uh, what uh, like activity offers like parking lot and ruling. So that is uh, primarily for you know designed for teachers, professors, and uh, trainers who are using online video. 
and it's a great you know mix of fun games, quick quizzes, and uh, cool displays. So you can uh, use that. Uh, we had uh, like another tool like Craftivity 2020, which is uh, basically a SCOM combined tool wherein uh, you know, people who are more interested in uh, uh, understanding about uh, the analytics side of it, they can use that. Then we have uh, uh, like Harbinger offers Williams, that is world's first uh, AI powered the question generation and note creation tool. So you just upload your text and you know instantly you can get questions as well as uh, notes for your class for preparation. Uh, we have uh, uh, exaltive interactive video player. Uh, you know, like YouTube is a one way tool where in video talks to you, you cannot talk to the video. So exaltive makes it easy for us to add interactivity on top of uh, your videos. And you know, that makes uh, the engagement uh, much higher in the classroom. Then we have uh, two more uh, tools. One is uh, a sprinkle zone, which is absolutely like a sprinkler, wherein you have your knowledge base, you attach sprinkle zone to it, and then you can just deliver uh, the personalized micro learning experiences to uh, the learners. And Pritella is a like chatbot, you ask and you get information, and then you know, it can be a, a uh, it can act as uh, at the university level or school level, and it can recommend courses now. So basically, these these are toolkit available. Thank you, Sandeep. That was quick. Uh, over to you, Surjan, for twenty seconds. Sorry, I got cut out before. Um, is there anything you wanted me to talk about in my final moments here? Just yes, yeah. <laughs> Whatever you were trying to say when you got cut out. No, um, no. It was I was just saying that. Um, the breakout rooms are a helpful tool. I think that interactive videos for the asynchronous lectures would be extremely helpful because mm -hmm. basically all you can do if you don't understand something in a video is rewind or you can go to office hours, which is once a week only for one hour. And they're very busy in the online times because everyone is confused. So that's just all I want to say about that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing and thank you everyone. Um, back to you, Rohan, for a closure. Thank you, Vikas, and to all our panelists for a wonderful discussion. And I'm sure we all are going back with some food for thought today. In the meanwhile, if anyone from our audience would have more questions or would like to reach out to our panelists, please feel free to drop us a line at products at harbingergroup.com. And uh, thank you once again, and wishing you all the best of health and stay safe. It was a pleasure having you all on this Power Hour session. Thank you. Bye. Thank thanks you. again. And thanks everybody in the audience. You've been wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good one. <laughs>